Who do you really think owns the world? It's a question that might get many different answers depending on who you ask, but there's one thing for sure. One company controls most of the world's wealth. The Federal Reserve, presidents, and world banks all have this company on speed dial. And you know what else? Not only did you put them there, but they're using your own money against you. That company is BlackRock and they've been handed the world on a silver platter. A company that would rather remain unheard of and in the shadows. It's a company that hides in plain sight, yet nearly nobody has ever heard of it until recently. It owns a piece of everything, yet claims to own nothing. It's coming for your dream home, and now it's even coming for your crypto. Founded in 1988, BlackRock is an absolutely colossal asset management company. In the 30 years since, they've become the largest asset manager in the world, controlling more than $10 trillion globally. To put that in perspective that you might be more familiar with if you watch this channel. The entire crypto market is currently worth less than one tenth of what the single asset manager controls. But this is just the tip of the iceberg as the roots run deep and impact every single aspect of your life. You can't eat, sleep, drive or even enjoy a walk in the park without BlackRock having some part in it. I'll discuss the hidden secrets of their influence much later in the video but for now buckle up because you're about to find out how they own all you see yet nothing at the same time. To be honest they own a bit of everything. If you put up the chart of all the world's largest companies, closed your eyes and threw a dart, chances are you'll land on a company that BlackRock owns shares in. Think of any large business, bank or industry. Exxon Mobil, Apple, Bank of America, BlackRock owns at least 6% in each of these. There are thousands of global companies that they have a stake in. And while this is rarely higher than 6%, owning that much of companies that size amounts to billions of dollars per holding that makes them one of the largest shareholders in each of them. But if they own so much, surely they're worth a lot as a company, right? Well, not exactly. BlackRock is only worth about $98 billion. But they own 6% of Apple, right? That's around $145 billion in share value alone. And that's just one of the many companies that they hold. Well, this is how. BlackRock, as an asset manager, invests and holds assets on behalf of their clients. These can be companies, other institutions, or private investors. This could be cash, mortgages, shares, or even your own pension. There's a good chance that right now, your pension is being invested in a company that BlackRock either controls or has a significant stake in, effectively giving BlackRock control of your pension. If you invest in companies yourself, most of the time you'll find BlackRock on the shareholder list. You'd have to look very hard to find a company that is untouched by their influence. They invest in every market on every continent and in almost every asset class. The car you drive has parts made by companies BlackRock owns. It uses fuel or energy that BlackRock helped supply. You drive on roads that government bonds backed by BlackRock helped build. You live in a house where the mortgage is securitized by BlackRock. Even if somehow you avoided the limitless reach of BlackRock directly, their influence and control goes much deeper than direct ownership. And they've built a global financial web of control and data analysis that extends beyond borders, regulators, and in most cases, even governments. Let's take a look at the manning control. What if I told you the person who runs BlackRock today was once disgraced and shunned in the financial world for losing his bank over $100 million? That might be surprising. How could someone who messed up that bad ever work in the industry again, let alone as chairman of the world's largest asset management fund? Well, it's true, and that man is called Larry Fink. In the early 80s, Fink helped pioneer mortgage-backed securities while working at First Boston. The guy running BlackRock, which owns a large chunk of the world, is the same guy that helped create the cause of the 2008 financial crisis. And it gets even better. Guess who the Fed, the banks, and the US governments all asked for help and advice during that crisis was? Like, which companies to save and which companies to abandon? Think. Think hard. Unsurprisingly, BlackRock's impartial advice just so happened to risk a lot of the assets and markets that BlackRock held investments in, both directly and indirectly. Of course, under normal circumstances, people might be worried about conflicts of interest here, but any complaints were drowned out by the sound of money printers and chaos in the financial world. Once it was all over, people were too relieved to really care too much about the details of who was whispering sweet nothings in the Fed's ear and how they benefited themselves. They were just happy that the market was green again. And that wasn't the last time that the Fed and the government came knocking either. The financial stimulus and printing in 2020 dwarfed 2008. Once again, they came back to Larry Fink and BlackRock for advice on how best to use the massive stimulus and debt buyback schemes to save the economy. The stimulus checks, no obligation relief loans, and the Fed's bond buying bonanza, all of these were okayed by BlackRock. In the days before and after the announcement of the Fed's stimulus program, the US Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin called Larry almost twice as much as the president, and second only to Jerome Powell, the Fed chair. Powell himself was in constant contact with the head of BlackRock during the crucial economic period. That's a lot of trust and power to put into a man who was once 
the laughing stock of Wall Street. This brings us back to exactly how Larry Fink lost $100 million back in 1986. Turns out he was responsible for some of the computer models in the bank that he worked for, which were used to determine trades. Unfortunately for Larry and his bank, there were some errors in these models, causing massive losses in both the trade and the hedges, wiping out entire positions. While for most people this would be a career ending mistake, Larry was instead galvanized to learn from these mistakes and rebuild his reputation. In 1988, he co founded BlackRock with a credit line of just $5 million. And with that new company came a new financial model designed by Larry. That was called Aladdin. Aladdin is BlackRock's own black box, the beating heart of the global financial risk management system. It's an AI portfolio management software developed in 1988 alongside BlackRock's foundation, and its rather creative name stands for Asset Liability and Debt and Derivative Investment Network. And it sounds kind of catchy. It does exactly what it says in the box. Over decades, this AI has been fed data and models used to evaluate and predict the risk of every outcome in the financial system. Think of it like the Borg from Star Trek. The Borg co-op technology and knowledge from other alien species and feed it to the hive mind. The more it absorbs, the smarter it gets. Although that's probably not a reassuring thought. So you give it a load of data on a thousand mortgages and it'll tell you which are most likely to default, how their value affects the set and applies risk scores to each one. The exact same risk scores you and I get when applying for credit. It'll do the same thing for almost any asset or financial instrument you can think of, given enough data and time. But after a while of hoarding all of this power to themselves, they decided to share it, but at a cost. They began to sell their system to other competitors in 1999, and every company that accepts its analytical benefits also feeds their data into the insatiable AI, increasing its total access to more information. For BlackRock, they got to make more money from their competition, force the entire market to rely on their system, and make it more powerful than it could have ever been alone. Very quickly, Aladdin became the backbone of risk management systems in America. If you've ever seen the movie Margin Call, there's a few scenes that talk about the models being wrong, and how if a few parameters are changed, everything goes under. Well, they're essentially talking about Aladdin in those scenes. This fictional movie based on real events highlights one of the biggest risks of Aladdin. Absolutely everybody is using it. The issue with everyone using the same system is if something's wrong, nobody will know until it's too late because there's no subjective or competitive analysis being done. If Aladdin says two plus two is five and every other major bank and investment firm's computer says the same thing, the one guy that's saying two plus two is four is gonna look real stupid. Of course, in this case, instead of basic arithmetic, it's unimaginably complex financial derivatives. Everything I've just said only relates to the systematic risk. In the end, this system is developed and controlled by BlackRock and all the major competitors that use it. They have the final say on what gets changed, how the data gets used, and they have an unprecedented access to critical global information that not even the most secretive of government institutions could dream of. Today, Aladdin is directly involved with the management or trading of 50% of all ETFs, 17% of all bonds, and over 10% of all stocks traded worldwide. That's $21 trillion of value controlled and managed by a single AI. That means an AI controls more wealth than the entire GDP of the USA. Skynet would be proud. Let's not think that it's slowing down anytime soon either. Just recently this year, BlackRock acquired eFront, feeding real estate and private equity data from private individuals like you and I to Aladdin. Now I know just a few minutes ago that I said it's a company that almost no one has ever heard of, but if BlackRock's name sounds familiar to you, it's probably from all of the media coverage that it received in 2021 about it allegedly buying up single family homes in America. This came amid a housing market bubble, which made it extremely difficult to buy property. I'm sure you remember the stories about homes being snapped up the same day that they went on the market or bidding wars far exceeding their value. But how true is this claim? Was BlackRock going around using your own pension fund to bid against you on your dream home? Are they responsible for fueling the current housing bubble using their endless funds to push poor families out of their homes? Well, yes and no. You see, there's a good reason very few people have ever heard of BlackRock, and that's because they're extremely careful to not own things outright. BlackRock has responded to these accusations by flatly denying they're directly buying single family homes. And that's true. But what they're doing is buying up or increasing their holding stakes in other companies which directly buy build or lease single family homes. And they're expanding this investment aggressively. In the third quarter of 2021, 42% of homes for sale in the Atlanta metro area were to institutional investors. And these largely became rental properties. This trend is all over America. And while the name on the dotted line might not be BlackRock themselves, most of the time BlackRock owns part of the institution that is. Some of these homes went for as much as 50% over asking price, which is ridiculous. But if you're a large investment company with deep pockets and a focus on long-term rent margins, you've got a way broader horizon than most. BlackRock, seemingly unsatisfied with owning just our natural world, 
has decided it wants to own our digital world too. The planet's largest asset manager has officially moved into crypto. Last month, Coinbase agreed to a deal with BlackRock to open its data doors to the Aladdin platform, allowing institutional investors to directly add Bitcoin to their portfolio. This is a spot purchase network, meaning that every coin added is a coin bought. At a time when Bitcoin is hovering around $20,000, institutional investors like BlackRock could open the floodgates to enlarge a $380 billion market cap to a potential market worth trillions. Only time will tell how much of an impact this will have on the crypto market as a whole, and as beneficial to prices as institutional investment can be, the core essence of crypto is decentralization. So I can understand people being worried about a monolithic shadow bank expanding its control into the crypto market. Of course, they could potentially own a large chunk of the market already, meaning that they can manipulate the market in whichever direction they see fit. Perhaps they decide to push prices down to get a better spot entry for their clients, or keep the market stable while the global financial market goes to ruin and crypto comes out on top as the hero. And once again, BlackRock wins because they hold majority stake. Now, of course, this is just speculation that the faceless institutions will one day hold and trade the majority of crypto and NFTs, just like they currently do with stocks and bonds. But it is a worrying thought, especially if they start asserting their financial might to change the very nature of crypto and the platforms they're trading on. If you've been in the market for a while, then you've probably seen how quickly the narrative around certain protocols can change with just a few news articles. Now, imagine if they had full control over the price as well. Luckily for now, it's only Bitcoin, but they've said they're coming for other tokens soon, especially considering their new ESG narrative. BlackRock is known for operating behind the curtain, but they may have overplayed their hand recently in a letter that caught the attention of the public and the companies that they apply pressure on. There's a common misconception that as an asset management company, BlackRock and its shareholders don't own much that their clients do and that BlackRock only manages it on their behalf, acting as a passive investor and doing what is in the best interest of their shareholders. This was perhaps how it used to act until 2018. You see, Larry Fink writes an annual public letter to CEOs, which generally talks about overall trends and goals. However, in 2018, he penned a letter which caused a huge backlash. Contribute to society or risk losing our support. This is what it stated, and it's pretty blunt. For a company that grew considerably by investing in the fossil fuel sector, many CEOs and the general public saw this as a direct overstepping of power by a large, unelected corporate figure. And that's understandable. It's definitely a change of tune from going from a profit at any cost policy to championing the ESG scores of what they now deem as troubling industries. What BlackRock essentially told the world was that for companies to comply with their ESG demands or find themselves across the table from a very powerful opponent with board voting rights. This wasn't just a casual warning. It was a threat. In 2021, BlackRock used its influence again and voted to back three candidates to the Exxon board, who were in favor of a more environmentally friendly approach to Exxon's future. BlackRock then used the same voting power against a different oil producer, but this time its target was in Australia, to oppose a director that they felt wasn't doing enough to support responsible emission targets at Woodside Petroleum. They take their ESG principles very seriously, it seems. Serious enough to block potential financial returns and stability in companies to achieve their goals. These are just a couple examples where BlackRock has directly or indirectly used its huge voting power to get its way in different companies and industries around the world. With this much control and influence, the question needs to be asked. Is it right for one company to have this much power? And what happens if it gets into the wrong hands? This question has been asked many times before, and for good reason. Controlling such a large portion of the world's wealth is one thing, but the Aladdin platform and AI presents a fundamental risk to the world's financial structure. It's been said that if Aladdin were to ever go offline, the world would be plunged into a stone age of financial chaos, with banks and investment firms turned upside down worldwide. But what if, instead of a system failure, a bad actor got control of BlackRock systems, whether through a hack or simply by organizing control or political pressure. If someone with less than neutral intentions got the keys to Aladdin, they could cause incredible damage to the world's economy, or even exploit its data to influence worldwide markets and sink any company that uses its platform. A large part of BlackRock's power is in its right to vote as a shareholder in the world's largest companies. If a government or an individual with a specific agenda gained control of BlackRock, they could influence the world across borders without much difficulty. Of course, you could say that Larry Fink already fills this role, pushing their ESG agenda, but it could be much, much worse. So when you own the world, what is the next step? Naturally, it's self-preservation and control, right? Back in 2016, BlackRock became the first US company to achieve a foreign institutional investor license to operate in China. At this time, this was unprecedented and sent shockwaves throughout the global markets and geopolitical discussion. How had a US company like BlackRock, so entrenched in the Western capitalist ideals 
officials gained the favor of the Chinese state, officials and business leaders. Clearly, their influence runs deeper globally than most people realize. And it isn't simply limited to the companies it owns and their zones of influence, but has the means to cross borders and cultures to get what it wants, whether that's being on the president's speed dial or deciding how the world should look in the future. Regardless of whether BlackRock's AI has informed them that China is the place to be, or if they're simply continuing their trend of being involved in every aspect of our lives, no matter where you live, BlackRock certainly isn't planning on going anywhere anytime soon. While it might not own the world itself, BlackRock definitely seems to act like it does. Maybe the only way to regain any of the control would be if everyone withdrew their investments from BlackRock at the same time, leaving them owning nothing but a few empty buildings. Oh, and of course, the world's most powerful AI. I'm sure it wouldn't be resentful at all of being deprived of all of that information, now would it? With that in mind, BlackRock is still a company, a company whose shares are down more than 40% this year. If you wanna find more about the current recession, which might be dragging it down, don't forget to watch this video. If you made it all the way to the end of the video, please comment down below, AI uprising. If you liked the video, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button, give it a like, and as always, I shall see you in the next video. Bye-bye.